Uh, dear students uh, and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Mel Eisenberg from Ohio State University. Ohio, Oklahoma State University. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, Merle Eisenberg uh, studied history and government uh, at Colby College in Maine, Missouri, Maine, <laughs> uh, and at King's College in London, where he received a master's degree in medieval history. From London, he returned to the United States for doctoral studies at Princeton University, where he received his PhD in 2018. After finishing his PhD, he worked first as a lecturer and research associate at the Department of History at Princeton University, and then as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Maryland and the University of Pennsylvania. And since fall 2021, uh, Merle Eisenberg is assistant professor of history at Oklahoma State University. Um, Merle is a historian of late antiquity and the early Middle Age. In his research, he examines the various impacts of the transformative moments of historical change that characterize this period or periods in history. He is uh, presently working on two book projects that deal with specific aspects of this transformation of the world of late antiquity. The first, based on his PhD dissertation, is a study titled Building Little Rome's Christianity, Identity, and the Formation of the Medieval West. In this study, Eisenberg explores how uh, the way individuals, communities, and states can conceptualize their place in the world change at the end of late antiquity and ushering in the Middle Ages. The lecture today is based on his second project that is devoted to pandemics and history, the plague concept, disease and the end of antiquity. Within this project, Eisenberg tracks the development of the Justinianic plague and analyzes the plague's impact based on local conditions, but he also investigates the reception and use of narratives about the plague in later period up until today. Contrary to uh, what might suspect, uh, Merl Eisenberg started to work on the Justinianic plague before any one of us expected to actually live through a pandemic ourselves. And, uh, and I highly doubt that even he himself uh, expected that the topic of his study would suddenly uh, become daily news. But even before the latest pandemic started to dominate our lives, the studies on the Justinianic plague that Mill Eisenberg and his colleagues uh, already published in scientific journals had attracted a lot of attention and also critical commentary. Uh, since the pandemic started, general interest in his research and in the insights from history that it can potentially provide uh, increased, for obvious reasons, dramatically, and Merle has become a frequent commentator also in the Daily News himself, from CNN to the Washington Post. Um, it was originally planned that Merle Eisenberg would join us in this term uh, as visiting professor of the Tzatz uh, here in Zurich. Because of his recent appointment at Oklahoma State University, he was regrettably unable to come to Zurich uh, for this term. We are all the more happy, uh, however, that he was ready to teach his planned course on pandemics in history, 
in part online, but also to come to Zurich uh, in these days now to give a seminar in the next two days on his topic, but also to present his work uh, today in this lecture. We are very happy, uh, dear Merle, to have you here and are eager to hear about your work. Yes, cool, okay. I've never used such fancy technology before. Um, and I should say thank you for the, the very kind introduction uh, and I'm delighted to be here today. This is my uh, first uh, live lecture uh, since uh, COVID, um, so we will see how that goes. Um, and thanks as well to my sponsors and also the students in the course I've had where I've learned uh, quite a bit. Um, and I should say as well, uh, we're obviously all living during a pandemic because it's ongoing, and that's obviously going to show up to an extent in this talk. Um, and I should just be forefront uh, about this, um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. But my perspective on this and how I use to shape my ideas is certainly a U.S.-based perspective. Right, So all of you can yell at me and say, this is different uh, here, uh, but that's part of what's happening to all of us. Um, and I can't do anything else other than be my own perspective. So uh, the talk today, I always like to give uh, good outlines um, so you can follow along, or if you want to fall asleep uh, somewhere in the middle and then pick right back up as you wake up, uh, is to give a, a brief introductory remark on pandemics and history, and then give some background uh, on the plague itself, um, just to catch us all up to speed. Some of you may be very familiar with uh, epidemiology. Some of you may have never picked up uh, any type of scientific article at all. And then I wanna look at uh, some sources on the Justinianic plague, which is what I've worked on will be the avenue into the broader talk. And then I will give uh, what I've been working on, which is say a reframing of uh, the pandemic itself, uh, followed at the end, as you can see here, by uh, modern stories, right? And so the shape of modern stories, as was, as was pointed out, is a central part of my project, um, as well as uh, something I've just finished uh, on movies and popular culture and that perspective and what that brings to how a lot of us have thought about pandemics. So with that outline done, as I like to do, it's three things, two, two sub things in each one we will start uh, kind of with a broad introductory point. So given the ongoing COVID pandemic, we've all understandably become fixated on diseases and pandemics in the past, the present, and indeed the future. Now, this is intensified during COVID, right? With just a few examples you can see here on the screen, I stopped collecting them after a little while um, because it got overwhelming. But often, and these examples are, are quite notable, they're never done by historians and very rarely on specialists by disease. Now, this work uh, spans what we might call the academic and the public spheres. I don't see a difference between the two of them. They're part of a broader spectrum. They're gonna come up today in the talk uh, and they'll overlap. And each term, uh, as I said, uh, will be important. Now, I should say at the offset, given my own work, I've become particularly interested in engaging in more public facing scholarship. Um, and so that's something I, I, I very much support. Now, the other thing I'll say is that COVID hasn't created this morbid fascination with disease, but it's accelerated an ongoing trend of the last 30 to 40 years. And I'll point this out toward the end. Many of us have long internalized stories about some of these pandemics, right? So when I ask my students, what do you know about the Black Death, right? They just started listing a litany of things. Ended feudalism, it led to the reforestation of Europe. And I said, how did you know all this? And they said, I don't know, I learned it somewhere in, in school, right? So a lot of these pandemics have become more central, whether it's 1918 influenza, Ebola, and to a lesser extent, the Justinianic plague. Now, within this wide ranging academic and public discussion, there is a historical divide between the impact of pandemics, right? And we might group them as I've done just with some examples, five of each, as pre-modern versus modern, right? That is to say, the farther you go back in the past, right, the worse the impact, right? If you're a pre-modern pandemic, the impact is suggested to be worse. Now, in a sense, 
This shouldn't be surprising, right? The complexities of societies increased from the 19th century onward due to industrialization and the modern world in which we all live, right? The Anthropocene, if you want to use that term from environmental historians, is firmly uh, in swing. And it makes sense to an extent when you think about its immediate impact, that is to say mortality. Although, as we'll see, that's quite difficult to measure what mortality is in the past. If you look at just, say, demography, which I just excerpted this portion here, life expectancy certainly rises, right? Fewer people are dying of infectious diseases as you get to the 19th century, and how long people live is rising. Now, one thing to caveat all of this is that people have long noticed this happens before there's actually effective ways to stop a disease, right? That is to say, antibiotics and vaccines, as you can see the trend line, which will continue, starts before actual medical solutions. Yet modern societies believe they have won, right? And this idea leads to a certain period of triumph over disease that, again, I'll return to toward the end. But what I want to argue and discuss today, hopefully get some feedback from all of you, doesn't change what we might see as a generally evolutionary model that is proposed when it comes to the impact of a pandemic. And again, split between these two broad categories. If the first impact, or the first argument, excuse me, was about its immediate impact, that is mortality, then what I want to talk to in more detail about today are assumed what we might call secondary effects, right? What happens after people die? And this is what I've outlined here with a couple arrows at the bottom. When we group pre-modern pandemics together, we tend to have crisis, that is say the pandemic, followed by collapse, right? This is what pre-modern pandemics are said to do. Now, what I mean by collapse, we can nuance here. If you look at popular analysis, which I'll get into a second, we literally mean the end of empires, the end of states, right? As academics, we would say that's not really plausible, but it takes more time, right? That something happens because of these pandemics that begins a process which ends with structural change and structural collapse. In contrast, modern pandemics, right, are said to lead to some form of resilience and crisis, or sorry, transformation, right? Here I mean explicitly of states, of polities, of empires, whatever you want to call them, and I should also note there's a very dark side to this resilience and transformation that I'll touch upon later. But these assumptions that I've sketched out are the form of the questions when we go in to investigate these different pandemics. Right? These arrows I've sketched out are how we begin macro and even micro case studies. Right? It's the assumptions we bring to the conversation. That is to say, with the five on the left, we debate, and I've been part of this debate for better or worse, did states collapse and become something new because of the pandemic? And the ones on the right, we don't ask those questions, right? We ask instead, as we probably all heard about COVID a million times at this point, that it holds up a mirror to society or something like that, right? Whether then, then whether the state fixed or did not fix those issues. So again, using my US perspective, COVID, the obvious thing that it's done, among many things, is it's shown disparities in deaths based on race, class, gender, socioeconomic status on down the line. And the question then becomes in the United States, as we're having a debate as we speak, is do you put in things that address those questions, right? So I'm fully in support of programs that put in place an actual social safety net the United States just does not have, right? That is to say, maternity care, parental leave, uh, child care, go on down the line. What is directly missing from the pandemics on the left, I'll suggest, are actual social and cultural histories of the pandemic. What this all put together suggests is that histories of pandemics that go from the plague of Athens, we might broadly construe even earlier, are in a rush to go from there, that is to say the past, to here, right, where we're in a modern world where we are today. They assume an evolutionary narrative of human progress, that's teleological, with the very simple idea that people inevitably gathered together in larger numbers, creating more disease over time, leading to pandemics, until modern medicine came along and resolved this. Right? Now, I can't spend this talk <laughs> covering every pandemic I just listed, because you would all probably fall asleep at that point, and I would fall asleep as well. But I'll spend some time today to explore this idea using the case study I know best, which is the Justinianic Plague. <laughs> 
Now, as you can see here on the screen, it's used to explain all types of political, cultural, social upheavals that supposedly ended the ancient world and ushered in the Middle Ages. In this story, the Justinianic plague, as I just noted, is a key non-human driver of historical change, right? It's a really simple idea and one that's very hard to combat, I would very much agree with, right? Society, humans simply follow biology, right? It's, you can go on down the line, the fall of Rome, one of the three major groups of reasons, not the 218 that have been proposed, but one of the groups of reasons I would suggest, the rise of Islam, et cetera, et cetera. And again, depending on where you fall in the academic or uh, uh, public spheres, you will make this out to be a bigger or lesser thing. So that's the general narrative uh, that we want to follow. Now, for the middle part of this talk, I want to go through the background and the causes about the Justinianic plague as my case study to explore uh, how the narrative is created and then the alternative way to do this. But before I do that, I do want to talk about uh, plague. So plague is the bacterium Yersinia pestis, named after its, one of its discoverers. That's a whole other debate, uh, Alexander Yersin. Uh, it is uh, something uh, that lives generally in the guts of fleas or other ectoparasites, as my four-year-old children know. Um, and those then live on small animals, as you can see. Sometimes they're cute, sometimes they're not so cute. Um, and those generally subsist within that uh, uh, cycle, that epizootic cycle, right? Every once in a while, for reasons we don't know, and this is actually kind of important because if you're gonna make suggestions about the past, you have to actually know about the biological stuff in the present, which we don't know. Uh, the, uh, there'll be a spillover effect in which the fleas will stop living on uh, the rodents and they'll jump into humans and bite them, right? And then when that happens, you get three forms of it. Bubonic plague, named after, as you can see in the image here, the buboes that are there. And then you will also get uh, uh, septicemic and pneumonic plague, which are uh, more deadly, uh, and those are transmit from human to human. Well, pneumonic will, at least. The plague in history has three pandemics. This is very messy. As with all good history, I should just say it's more complicated than it looks. But the story we tell is of these three pandemics, the Justinianic plague, uh, the Black Death, and the third plague pandemic. Now, again, this is actually a very European story and thus a very problematic story, but this is the general way in which it's sketched out. And the Justinianic plague and the Black Death also neatly sit between antiquity and the Middle Ages and the Middle Ages and the modern world, which is also an interesting feature versus the third plague pandemic either has a name nor does it sit at a neat juncture of human history. Now, as I've suggested and have called it, uh, recent literature, which I we've dubbed the maximalist approach, makes it out to be a disaster across human history, right? It's a major catastrophe. And again, depending on where you sit, uh, ends the Roman Empire or do, does other things. Now, this impact in academic literature, as I said, is more subdued. Once you go to popular literature, it gets more uh, crazy, for lack of a better term, right? So uh, this graphic here from the AFP uh, was produced during COVID about pandemics in history, suggesting that 100 million people died. It's obviously impossible because there aren't 100 million people around to die, um, but it actually comes from a side note from Edward Gibbon, so I always like that statistic, um, neither here nor there. Uh, what I've done uh, with a couple of number of colleagues is to push back on this um, in several studies, which I'll talk a bit about today. Um, and we can disagree or agree with the points that I'm going to raise today and what follows. But what I do want to call your attention to is if you look at the popular narratives, how this has made it into the mainstream, right? That essentially the articles that I wrote got picked up to say, actually, no, half the world didn't die, right? So it seems to suggest that there is, again, in that spectrum uh, of view that a lot of people did in fact die. So onto the actual meat of the Justinianic plague itself. Let me just take a drink of water, as they say. And I should say there's a lot more sources I could discuss. If you're curious in the q and I can, um, but for the sake of time, I've exerted the ones that we can talk about in short detail. <clears throat> 
So here is the probably the most famous case. Um, if you all teach uh, uh, any ancient history class or medieval class, you probably assign uh, one of two things about Procopius. You either assign the secret history, the really juicy bits about Theodora, or you assign, uh, probably now because of the pandemic, the section about uh, the outbreak of plague. And this certainly happens in the year 542. It's in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul today. Uh, there's the Hagia Sophia that Justinian built. Um, and so, uh, as you can see here from the top, it's just a short discussion that it is in fact plague. We know that for a scientific fact now, um, but that's how it works. And then at the bottom is kind of perhaps the most famous part of this passage, which gives us some numbers on mortality, right? So first, uh, uh, ran for four months, 5,000 people died a day, then 10,000 people died a day, right? This is the famous passage. Um, the problem with this is if you just do some basic back of the envelope math, if you think Constantinople had a population of say half a million people, uh, you've basically, if you take an average of 5,000 and 10,000, you've killed 7,500 people a day, you've killed 675,000 people in three months. So you've killed the entire city more than once over, right? So that the actual numbers are clearly not meant to be taken literally. There's other reasons we could talk about, but back of the envelope math works. And what you get from Procopius is that it clearly means a lot of people died. Now, whether that a lot means 1%, 25%, 50%, pick your favorite number in between, is open for debate. Now, there's also outbreaks in the West. Again, it's certainly plague. The most famous account, again, is from Gregory of Tours. He'll basically uh, refer to it in this way, so some kind of swelling of the groin. Again, it's certainly plague. And I'll get to that in a second. Now, the quote-unquote collapse in the Eastern Roman Empire, which is often suggested, is easier to argue, right? Because there's a state that survives for another, I don't know, eight, I can do some math, 800 years, no, 900 years, right? But in the West, the analysis already begins to break down, showing how these ideas are really overlooked, right? There's no collapse in the West to be had because such as you believe the Western Roman Empire collapsed, it's already collapsed in a political sense. Now, we also know it's plague because of the new cutting edge ancient DNA research, right? What you see here on the left is a researcher, how this works in brief is you uh, dig up remains, you extract the teeth, you pulverize them into a pulp, you run them through uh, machines, and that tells you what kind of DNA is in the teeth, right? And if you get a positive hit, you can test for a bunch of things, but one thing you can certainly test for is plague, and you can find out if the person died of plague. And then once you do that, you can make what's called a phylogenetic tree, which is what you see here on the right. This is a fancy way of saying a family tree of the plague itself. And as you can see at the top, there's a third plague pandemic for which there's a lot of uh, specimens. You have the Black Death with its own tree and the Justinianic plague as well. Now, interestingly enough, you can see the dates there. That's its own problem, but I'll leave that aside from now. There's also issues with doing ancient DNA research as well. The one thing I'll say is I do believe as a historian that ancient DNA is another source that we have to bring to the table, right? We have to learn how to use it, learn how to read it, and I'm in favor of it as evidence. But you also have to step back and realize what it can and cannot answer for you or even ask for you. It allows you to understand two things really well, which is what this phylogenetic tree does. The origins of the disease, if that's of interest, and the transmission of the disease, right? Which is to say, as you see it evolves over time and you have different sites, you can realize that obviously if it's evolutionarily earlier, that it had to be at that site earlier, right? How you date the sites is another debate we have, but it allows you to answer where did it start and where did it go, right? It cannot answer, at least at the moment, anything social, political, economic, cultural, anything else in between, right? It can't prove collapse, it can't prove resilience, really anything, right? You have to approach it alongside other disciplines that you can use, let's say archaeology, to learn about, say, the cultural context of burials and what that means for changing burial habits and these types of questions. Now, the problem at the moment is we do tend to leap to conclusions. So if you find a positive result, you tend to think, yes, I have plague, which does mean that there are more victims there. But again, it doesn't tell you what you necessarily want to know. Here then is 
There's now updates from a conference that I was at a few months ago, but here is, uh, as of 2019, all of the ancient DNA finds. Um, it's the pink and the yellow on the screen, and then the cross-hatching is everywhere where plague broke, breaks out, right? The problem is, is, as I show you here at the bottom, you then take any evidence you have and you apply the same logic across it, right? So you take the Procopius reading that we just had and you think about, okay, that's what it shows in Sicily. The first person to use the Sicily account was, was Dennis Stathakopoulos, and it has a wonderful um, uh, handbook of famine and pestilence, which I highly recommend for especially the appendix if you ever want to just know about all the dated outbreaks of plague and pestilence. And he points out that Sicily might be an example here, right? And what we have from Sicily is one inscription uh, about three boys who died in the same year. The problem is it's on an addiction dating cycle, and thus it means one year in a 15-year dating cycle anywhere across the entire sixth century. So you get multiple years. It's dated to 542 because three boys died in one year. So thus we think it's plague, and thus we date it to 542 because it's plague, and you can see how the circular logic works. Again, plague almost certainly reached Sicily um, just because of its position in the Mediterranean, but the question is, what are your assumptions when you aggregate data? So those are the sources that are usually shown and their problems. What I want to discuss now is how to begin to write a social and cultural history of the Justinianic plague through resilience and transformation as a framework. And again, this is the beginning uh, and what I think it might look like. So the first thing that struck me when I read accounts of Procopius, uh, or really anyone, are kind of the crazy, what seemed irrational responses to plague, right? throwing pitchers onto the street to stop the disease, seeing ghosts, right? All these types of things. But what I realized after doing this, after reading Procopius again, after COVID, is that it's actually not far from our own reactions, right? This seems to be a universal response to a sudden outbreak, right? Now, what I mean by irrational means what that means in its own cultural context. Right? So for me, if you were like me and my family, you had a competition to see who could be the most restrictive when it came to COVID pre-vaccines. So uh, my family and I all wiped down our groceries for about a week with bleach because that's what the first scientific studies said was that it spread and lasted on bags and these types of things for three days, right? So this was kind of a problem. In retrospect, I look back and I go, what are you completely irrational? What are you doing? But this is how it is, um, I think, early in any outbreak. And here is my parents. They refuse even to this day to basically go into grocery stores. Um, and since they're older, they can leave their cart parked outside and the grocery store people will come out, put their groceries in while my parents are six feet away and then they'll take the cart. Even in the summer, they wore heavy gloves so they weren't touching the cart. This is, again, after multiple months in studies, and they would push it up the hill, right? So again, you can walk this back in these types of things. Now, the Justinianic plague has many of these things, which I think need a lot more work to be done. There's also apocalyptic ideas that are involved in this very strongly. Um, my colleague David Gyllenhaal at Princeton is showing in his work that by the time of the sixth century, these apocalyptic ideas are not new, but based on existing strands that were brought together and deployed at particular moments, right? So taking those ideas into account. It's not a single moment of hysteria, but the deployment of well-known end times discourses and which ones you choose based on the Justinianic plague at the time. The second universal response, and again, this I long thought, uh, but it really struck me reading with the students in the course, is uh, what to do with excess mortality, right? Burial problems are probably the number one uh, issue that come up uh, in every pandemic that I've ever read about, right? And what it seems to suggest is any uh, death rate that's even slightly above normal, right? 1918 influenza, COVID, as I give you this example here from Hearts Island from the beginning in New York City, right? This is always recorded and pointed out. Burial problems simply have no ability to deal with increased mortality when it comes to the administration and economics of this process, right? not a mortuary person, but there's probably good uh, economic and administrative reasons, right? And Constantinople also has this burial problem, right, very clearly. And the outbreak in Constant Constantinople witnessed, as I've listed here, escalating responses by state officials, 
along with working closely together with residents to respond, right? So here I've listed in order all the changes, right? This is a notable problem. Um, you know, when people want to ask me, what are some positives you can take from the past? Uh, I always say, well, you know, when the outbreak happens, the account we have is that the two rival factions, the Blues and the Greens, stopped actually fighting each other uh, during the Justinianic plague and came together to bury the bodies, right? And everyone says, oh, well, you know, we didn't, Republicans, Democrats didn't even seem to do that in the United States. And I said, yeah, so there's your positive positive spin on the burial question. What about stresses on systems? The Emperor Justinian has, has long been known since at least J.B. Burry's uh, later Roman Empire in 1923, and then it's essentially restated every 10 years until you know, a couple of years ago, uh, has a series of laws that he puts in place, right? And we know this, uh, that, that he puts in laws, these are the two most famous on wage and price controls and on the banks, right? And this seems to be tied to immediate problems with the plague, as well as adjust to issues. Now, the question of these laws is not that they demonstrate systematic collapse, but that they show, I think, state-based resiliency, and in some cases, transformation in how the functioning of the fiscal system works. This change in the fiscal system, I'll suggest, is actually a longer durée change that I've discussed in an article. It's not about plague, uh, but it's about taxes with my friend Paolo Tedesco, which came out early medieval Europe. Um, and so what you see here is that there's no issues specifically related to tax exemptions, tax reliefs, these types of things, right? These are pretty common about war and just for churches when they ask for it, for example. Um, but you do have uh, different structures. The second thing we can see from the Pyrie evidence uh, in Egypt is there is a reduction uh, for about three years in the grain supply. The grain is supplied to Constantinople from Egypt because the city's too big, so it needs an external supply. And what you see in the papyri evidence, uh, this is Constantine Zuckerman's work, uh, is that for about three years, there is a reduction. What happens is by five years after the 542 outbreak, it's actually above pre-plague level, right? Now, the obvious explanation perhaps for this is that it's a capital city, we'd imagine larger percentage of deaths, so there's an adjustment for this as well as reduction in what's shipped, and then over time it goes back to what it was, right? So again, state-based resilience, we definitely see an impact, we definitely see mortality, but the question is how does the state respond? There's also uh, interesting data put together by uh, my friend, teacher, colleague, Alan Stahl, uh, the director of numismatics at Princeton. Uh, we just kind of asked him on a whim one day, back in the early days of COVID, has anyone ever looked at the coinage uh, in depth? Uh, and he said, oh, I'll just go do it. And he did it in like 24 hours <laughs> and came back to us with it. And this is what it looks like when you look at it together. Uh, to briefly walk you through it, the Emperor Justinian puts in place a substantial reform of uh, the bronze phallus um, in 538, 539. You can see the pre-reform type on the left. It looks visually very different, right, in terms of which way the emperor is facing. And it's also lighter and smaller, very clearly. So as a reduction, what happens in the second stage is in 542, 543, that is to say the year of the plague outbreak in Constantinople, there is a reduction in the size and the weight, right? So the middle one you see there is the reform, and then you see a post-reform coinage. Now, every time I've suggested that I think this is a good indicator of perhaps an impact of plague, what economic historians come back to me and they say, number one, this seems like a very fast change if the outbreak is in 542. And number two, the number of coins is actually much smaller. And so one other explanation that's pretty obvious is you have a sufficient number of coins in circulation, and thus you basically have a smaller uh, issue and, and size is the other explanation, which might not have to do with plague. It might have to do with plague. We obviously don't have written sources, but it seems to me a partially convincing explanation if you tie it to the rest of the economic situation of what happens immediately afterwards. The other type of source that we've put together, and there's going to be a larger study on this, both on the Black Death uh, and on the Justinianic Plague, I think, in the near future. But you can use uh, another type of what we call proxy data, that is to say, data that gives you some kind of correlation about um, what's happening in the world. And here, uh, this is pollen data. So what you do, as my little stick figure friends is do, are doing, you dig a giant uh, core, you pull out the core, uh, as you can see on the right, 
And you can date these layers. Some of them are more tightly dated. If you're really curious, I can go into it in Q&A. Um, and so you can individually date these layers year by year in some cases, right? And so you can see what the core looks like. That's some pollen. That's not what it actually looks like. It's been colorized because it makes it easier to see rather than very boring browns. Um, and when it comes to the Black Death, as this good example from Sweden shows, I think, uh, what you see, the dotted line is the outbreak of the Black Death. Beforehand, you see rising agricultural use, right? Agricultural use being a proxy for number of people, right? More people working the land, producing more stuff. And on the right of that, you can see a drastic drop off, right? So it seems to suggest something is happening here. Whether or not you want, if you didn't know the Black Death was around, you probably just think a whole bunch of people died and you have no idea why. Um, but that would seem to be a plausible explanation. When you put this together, as my colleagues have done for the Justinianic plague and to make your life more complicated, of course, it's a line graph rather than a bar graph. Um, but again, the dotted line is uh, the outbreak of the plague. And what you're looking for is a change in the slopes, right? So that is to say, is it changing rapidly based on the increase and the decrease, right? These are all from the Eastern Mediterranean, the regions that we'd expect to be hit the most right around Constantinople for the most part. And what you get here is actually very clearly kind of something of a nothing picture, which is not to say that there was no impact, but simply that there's no radical change in land use like we saw previously. So what's going up beforehand, right? You might look at say Northern Greece, and if you work on Northern Greece, you would say it's becoming uh, greater, greater instability is spreading because of Slavic or uh, later Avar invasions, et cetera, et cetera, beforehand from the Huns, go on down the line, make your own assumptions. That all continues. So when it comes to the Eastern Roman Empire, what I think we have is a picture of resilience and transformation to an extent in the economic system, but long-term changes that suggest not the complete reordering that exists, but in fact working within different frameworks that are already around. And you could extrapolate this, as I've started to do, um, the question always becomes how micro do you need to get before you can draw larger conclusions. But if you think about, uh, for example, the city of Arles, which is, as we saw earlier from Gregory of Tours, thought to be hit perhaps worse by the plague. Here I think I'll suggest that I think the plague also plays a role in the history of this city. But the question is, how do you disaggregate that? So to make a long story short, for most of the fifth century, Arles itself was the Roman capital of Gaul, right? Still highly recommend visiting there uh, to this day. But by around 500, it's no longer a center because of new political borders. So a slow and steady decline, if you want to use that term, in its political, economic, and cultural importance is taking place. And this accelerates about 10 years before the plague in the 530s, Right, certainly by the Merovingian takeover of southern France as the power shifts north, first to Lyon and then other places. And written sources do say that Arles hit worse because it still is a key port at the mouth of the Rhone River. Right? And by 600, Arles had become secondary in importance to even Marseille in the region. And we do know there's plague there, as you can see from that one grave, and there's others I know that are in the line. So what it seems to be the case is that plague plays a role in accelerating what's already happening, right? And we arrive at an outcome that looks not too, many, too much different from other pandemics in history. You have diverse impacts based on the complex interplay of human, environmental, and biological factors, right? So that the local events are here are key and not to jump simply to catastrophic conclusions, but to look at how this plays out on a local scale and build that up over time. So what I want to do next then is talk about 20th and 21st century ideas about disease, plague, and pandemics more generally. And I think the modern stories are as important as the ancient ones, and I'll make this case over and over again, uh, because they form the basis for how we construct disease narratives and why we think these differences exist. Right? And again, I'll use the Justinianic plague um, as the example, but I'll dip in and out. So as I said, I think we start with the assumption that plague is a big deal, right? And again, on a simplistic level, the answer here is obvious, right? We have less information, so we make bigger claims the farther back we go in the past. We just have to. Uh, 
But on another level, past pandemics are useful because they place a premium on the power of biology, on the pathogen itself, right? And here I give you just two examples of this. Again, one uh, popular culture and one from The Lancet, right? This is an article about ancient DNA. The Lancet is one of the foremost medical journals in the world today. Um, has been for a long time, I should say. But if you notice the imagery that's used, this is about a grave found in, in Bavaria. And what you see is the overlap between images that are used, right? There's a certain power, obviously, to symbols, to images. The Emperor Justinian is there in the middle. This study has nothing to do with Justinian. Um, a large rat is there, just as you see a large rat. And I should say this is from a video game um, as well. And you can see this is supposed to be Constantinople in the 542 outbreak, right? It's dark, it's medieval looking, for lack of a better term piles of bodies, et cetera, et cetera. And the place and power of diseases over the 20th century has actually evolved quite a bit, as I'll discuss, but the biology and the impact of the Justinianic plague actually has not, right? Its impact has remained constant across about 125 years. It remains mired in ideas from the turn of the 20th century about pathogens triumphing over humans. Now, here on screen, uh, and I always wish I could do this as an interactive thing, what you see here is a program that Lee and I put together. Um, it's a chart of everything ever written about the Justinianic plague comprehensively uh, in English, German, French, and Italian, plus a few other languages thrown in for about 150 years. And the connections between them are when people cite each other, the bigger the blue thing, the, the more time someone cites things, right? And as you can see kind of on the screen, I've highlighted two key periods. One is the 1890s, and the other is really the 1980s, but really the 2000s to today. This is the period when pandemics became central topics then and are key to explaining just the Anic plague today. So the key to the 1890s pandemic was that it was directly linked to the Black Death which was then attached to the Justinianic plague at that point, right? That's when you get these three plagues laid out. This is the fear that if you read the literature from the 1890s, everyone's writing, the Black Death is coming back, right? And here I've put on one serious example and one funny example uh, for you to see this. And the first person to make this case was this uh, guy here, William Simpson. He's uh, a colonial administrator deeply racist. Um, he's also a professor at King's College London, so I always like to point that out. Although, if you read uh, what people wrote about him, they said he was a terrible lecturer. Um, he had no good lecturing voice, I believe that be. Um, but what happens within a few years is that the plague actually doesn't kill everyone, right? I'm not ruining the story here. But it's stopped and people have to claim that they have done better when they actually don't know why they've succeeded. So they start throwing out a whole list of reasons. And we still don't actually know why the third plague pandemic is so different from the other ones. And this is followed uh, in the mid 20th century by a collapse in this fear of infectious diseases. Uh, because if you read a great book by Fabian Hurst called The Conquest of Plague, uh, he'll say that we conquered plague at that point. Now, the other side to the study of modern pandemics that does pick up at this point uh, by historians is to show the importance of social factors, right, among others. Right? That modern pandemics helped shape public health very clearly, but that this was, came at the expense of non-Europeans. So this I've taken from the cover of, of Mike Van, a uh, professor out at Sacramento State, wrote a book called The Great Hanoi Rat Hunt. It's a graphic history. I highly recommend teaching with it if you want a really good, easy explanation of Foucault. It's actually in there um, for undergraduates, so I highly recommend it. But what he illustrates in here is the social determinants of health and people shape the impact of a disease, right? And that this mid-key century, this mid-century moment is key because human factors, right, become ever more important. Which is where work essentially on modern pandemics, modern diseases is when it comes to historians, right? Social, cultural, intellectual, go on down the line. That's what they work on. What happens from the 1980s onward and thereafter uh, is a focus and the biology comes back, right? AIDS famously uh, becomes a pandemic, um, but it's also followed by other contingent factors. Here is just a listing of infectious diseases in the web of science, um, which is an aggregate database. And you can see the huge astronomical increase um, in the number of people researching this. What this means increasingly is the focus on the biological effects of the disease in popular imagination. And so I want to turn to that very briefly, uh, mostly because uh, this is something that I've just finished working on. I think it's just as important. Now, 
The work I've done is to focus on movies as a uh, uh, popular culture. Um, it's movies and disease here. And you can see the same change over time, actually, in movies, as I just pointed out, when it comes to scientific research. You have three broad time periods. You have one of containment. You have one of what I've called imagined containment. And then you have one of an uncontainable pandemic. And the movies neatly follow that path. They also follow this second path, which is to say it evolves from a critique of society, social history, to the collapse of society, right? That's what all disease movies essentially show today. The social factors that Mike and others point to are gone from general discourse, not from specialist discussion, I should very clearly um, state. But what I'd suggest is that there's a dominant discourse here. And this, in turn, reinforces what we think about pandemics and how we write them, right? And just very briefly, I'll run through a couple examples. So the 1950s conquest narrative, I always like to point out, is Panic in the Streets, but you could also add The Seventh Seal if you like. Actually, you know, actually, the first, Panic in the Streets is a good movie by Elia Kazan as the director, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what it shows is plague is beaten and it's stopped <laughs> via governmental coordination, right? Which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and the movie is really about middle class conformity and immigration. And the movie is actually deeply xenophobic and racist, but we'll put that aside again for now. Uh, but what that shows very clearly is a different world today. And you could do the same thing with The Seventh Seal. The movie's not about the plague. Hopefully you've all seen The Seventh Seal, right? It's about an individual quest for spiritual self-examination and an attempt to find self-enlightenment, right? Set in the backdrop of the plague. The second uh, time period, we might say, is the mid-1990s to early 2000s. The dates here don't work perfectly, but the paradigma paradigmatic movie here would be Outbreak, right? That there is containment at the end of Outbreak. Hopefully I'm not ruining every movie for everyone in the audience. Um, but that, in fact, it doesn't make sense by the logic of the movie itself. There shouldn't be a contained Outbreak. And the movie actually has a romantic comedy, interestingly enough, um, but that there is a happy ending still. And this will last until actually post-2001, post-9-11. Uh, the two famous movies here, they actually become zombie movies, interestingly enough, are uh, 28 Days Later or in World War Z. Interestingly enough, 28 Days Later, which is always cited as the key movie here, they actually tack on a happy ending to that. The directors didn't want it, but they tacked it on in the same vein as Outbreak, right? But what you see happen here is an assumption of a widespread pandemic, killing millions, society collapses, no one can stop the end of the world, you can just live in that new reality. So what does this look like now and how does this relate to COVID? The most popular movie during COVID was Contagion. Um, I don't quite know why anyone watched it, you'd have to do a series of psychological studies. I had watched it before uh, COVID and I said, no freaking way am I watching this movie <laughs> during COVID. I had to put down a great book uh, by Nancy Toms called The Gospel of Germs, which is all about the cultural history of disease. I had to put it down because I said, this is way too close to home. Um, but people really like to watch the movie. This was like the most popular movie, the second most popular movie on iTunes um, downloads and like the most pirated movie. Was it on Netflix or Amazon? So that's why you have to use those two indicators. But the fact that it wasn't on those two things tells you actually something. But in any case, Contagion, if you haven't seen it, is the pandemic is not stopped until the very end. It kills millions of people and it's an, essentially the collapse, near collapse of society. It's the quote, most realistic disease movie ever made. They had consultants on the movie. But there's two key issues with these movies that I'll just point to. One is that it assumes the basic collapse of a functioning society, same as the Justinianic plague. And there's no discussion of the disparate impact of the disease, right? It kills everyone, they say it in the movie, regardless of class, race, gender, ethnicity. It simply kills everyone, which is essentially biologically impossible, um, but that's what it does. And these two ideas I suggested at the beginning is that society follows biology, right? That the plague does stuff without nuance. So to conclude, how then are pre-modern pandemics used? I would suggest here, as I suggested at the beginning, the Justinianic plague and other pre-modern pandemics actually never went through any of these intermediary stages, right? They never got a social cultural history of disease. They jumped from assumptions and fear of biological devastation, right, to basically straight back to the biological devastation. They operate within a different methodological framework, right? It's a debate over collapse, yes or no, and again, collapse in quotes. 
What then is the use of the Justinianic plague, right? As ancient and medieval historians probably get too tired of hearing, what are the stakes of your argument for me living uh, in 2021? The supposed massive effects in the past are used to offer some combination of fear, hope, or lessons to help guide our actions during COVID and into the future, right? I wrote something where I cataloged this over the first nine months, and those are the basic things that these past pandemics were used for. And the Justinianic plague, as it's currently used, allows us to make easy assumptions about the past to point to a, a worse place and that humans have naturally evolved into something better, right? To put bluntly, there was a time in the past where 50% of people died and the state collapsed, so aren't we all better today, right? We have better medical and scientific progress, which creates a binary of what the past was, right? In short, you know, we get ideas like this. And again, early on during COVID, this was actually quite common, right? That somehow wealth inequality would drop. And so I don't knock the people for writing this. It's a view by historians. Here you get Salon in the New York Times. Uh, but as I suggested in my discussion of economics, there's no evidence of this actually during the Justinianic plague, right? The only evidence we actually do have the Justinianic plague uh, is from a great passage in John of Ephesus, believe it if you want or not, but he discusses that actually all the rich people uh, died, more likely to die, right? Which is interesting for a cultural history of the time period, and we could ask a whole bunch of questions as we should, um, but uh, that's the only evidence we have, as far as I'm aware. We have to stop thinking of the impact of pandemics as simply greater, whatever that means, in the past than today. Yet our own modern ways of thinking, right, that is to say the U.S. has structurally problematic racist public health systems at points, make this simply untrue. Nor have our actions during COVID actually shown that to be somehow better, right? We have to break this binary, I would suggest, between the past and the present through this social cultural analysis. What does seem clear from the early days of COVID is the pandemic we're living through, and I'll admit this, will shape whatever we write about. So Misha Meyer had a really perceptive point that he made recently where he said, uh, what has COVID shown us will be the starting point for all discussions post COVID. And I think he's correct here. Uh, but then uh, as I asked him at the time, I said, you know, you have a very German view of this, right? Which is to say, just to character it, the one on the left, very detailed, give you good examples. I have a very American uh, way of doing this, which is to say, that's the only guidance I got. Just don't go around people, right? As opposed to particulars. And I looked quite hard to see if Maryland had better graphics regulations, but I could not find them, right? This is also quite important to acknowledge. And it's also allowed people, uh, and I think we do have to acknowledge the social factors are quite important here, right? As we all know. Here's a, a map of on the left, you see uh, where people died of COVID. The darker uh, the coloring, more people died. Uh, the lighter the COVID, this is in the blue, uh, fewer people have died. And this is uh, basically uh, the poorer neighborhoods, right? So Manhattan is obviously quite light because everyone in Manhattan just ran away to their homes in the Hamptons. The one on the right is where people got vaccines. Magically, they're obviously inverses of each other, right? And this is early on, but this is when, you know, everyone was scrambling for vaccines, at least in the United States, you sign up wherever you could, right? We know that social factors are key uh, in this pandemic. But these ideas, as I've suggested, are missing from uh, general pre-modern histories of pandemics, and you certainly can't find them in movies of the last 30 years, and I think that's also important to recognize. Basically, not a single mention of social factors, right? Whether it's economics, race, class, ethnicity, gender, whatever you want it to be. Not a single discussion in movies. And pandemics, as I say at the end here, don't just do things and they don't just end one day. Their impact is based on how we react to a disease in a social context and what our priorities are. And what we need then are images of pre-modern pandemics that offer social and cultural contexts, including disadvantages and advantages in the specific groups had alongside powerful stories of how states were resilient, I'll use that term here, and how individual lives were shaped during a pandemic as new stories for our own pandemic age. So with that, I'll just thank my uh, colleagues here who I've worked with and thank all of you for listening.
Uh, thank you, Merle, for this wonderful, very lively presentation. I think uh, you, uh, we didn't get bored, we didn't sleep through, uh, through uh, your lecture, even if you gave us uh, this outline that would have allowed us to wake up in between and, uh, and catch up. Um, I'm sure there are questions on, uh, for Merle. I think probably, yeah, if you want to use the mic. Yeah, I, I do. The one positive of an in-person talk is I can tell more jokes because it's always really hard to tell jokes through a series of black boxes on Zoom. And then I laugh at my own jokes and I make <laughs> jokes about me making jokes. And it becomes circular. Are there any questions? Um, if not, I, I would uh, I would start right at, at at the point that you made at the end uh, about uh, the role of disparate impact uh, yeah. of the of the plague, and I uh, I ask myself, uh, well, I. Uh, I, I agree that it's important, but what can we say about disparate impact uh, on uh, on the Justinianic plague? I mean, um, Justinian uh, was sick. Uh, we know of uh, of prominent member of the aristocracy who died. Um, um, what what can we uh, say beyond that? Yeah, yeah, no, that that's the key question. This is why I think ultimately, in some ways, the answer to that is not to to delve into the you know who died, who didn't mm. die question. Although you certainly need to do that, and hasn't been actually done very much. Um, but I think ultimately the question is is more of a cultural history question of why writers of the time shaped it as they did. Mm. Um, that ultimately, I think, is the actual way to go forward. Um, my point was simply to make that we don't even make uh, the first stage of assumptions. But you know, as, as I said toward the end, I mean, why, why do we have accounts um, from John of Ephesus, which are, I mean, there are good reasons for this, and there are people working on John of Ephesus, but mm. why do we have accounts where he says, you know, all the rich people are dying? Right. Mm. There's obviously biblical reasons for this. There's religious reasons, et cetera, et cetera. But those are the type of questions I think ultimately uh, we need to ask that just haven't even been thought about, um, mm. let alone asked. So I, I do completely agree um, that you need to contextualize the social impact. But you could, you know, obviously model this out if you want mathematically. It becomes deeply hard mm. and problematic um, pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, past that, uh, I think you need to start with that assumption and then move from there. Um, but it's the cultural history angle that I think will really lead to the most uh, benefit because ultimately when it comes to mortality, you know, I'm of the, I think I'm on the record saying this in written publications. I, th I don't think you'll ever really know, mm. right? I mean, it's just not possible um, until you get to really the 20th century with enough mm. information and sources. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this wonderful. Thank you very much for your wonderful paper. This was very illuminating and very interesting to listen to. I'm wondering about the reliability of Procopius in a way, because I mean, I was looking a little bit at the, uh, the plague in Athens, and my impression is that one is today, if I look at the work of Akrik, for instance, rather uh, more convinced of, of the, the numbers Thucydides is giving, whereas in the past also very often one would say, well, it's just an exaggeration and things like that. And of course, I mean, it sounds to be a lot, 5,000 up to 10,000, but if I have seen right, he does not say the, how long it was uh, as high uh, yeah. anyway. And then do we have other numbers where we can sort of uh, check them? Uh, has he a tendency to exaggerate or, or what is this uh, general assessment? Because I don't know a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other, the other set of numbers we have are from John of Ephesus who says something like, I forgot the exact context, but basically gets to about roughly 50 to 60 percent of, uh, of the population dies. Um, now, Again, how you argue from that to anything at that point is a question. I mean, the, the issue I have with Procopius is not that I think he's reliable or not. I mean, it's perfectly plausible to say 5,000 people died 
perhaps it's perfectly plausible to say 5,000 people died in the city a day, you know, for a few days. Um, and again, as I said, the question is, where, where does that lead you down the questions um, that you can actually answer? The, the issue I'd say with Procopius is certainly Constantinople, the outbreak there, is the most significant, right? It's the largest city, probably densest population, you know, you could debate about Alexandria, Antioch, but almost certainly that. Um, you know, I think the, the, the disservice to an extent, you know, I said we always assign Procopius, and I do, and I assign my students in the course Procopius, we take that as the normative narrative. And then we kind of say, well, we don't have a source from anywhere else. And if that's our norm, then we apply it everywhere else. That's kind of the problem I actually have with using Procopius. It's not necessarily, again, you could believe that a lot of people died in one day. I have no, uh, no problem with that. Um, I don't have a problem with that, but in terms of sources, <laughs> I have a problem with that. Um, but the question is taking that as your baseline. And this, I think, goes to a larger question. What is your baseline from what you then argue from? And so ultimately, by using that as your baseline, you start with that assumption, and then you export it everywhere else. Um, when in fact, uh, we know from studies in the Black Death itself, you know, which has high mortality rates, not denying that, but it's quite variable where those high mortality rates are, where they are, when they are over time. Um, and the same thing is true of the third plague pandemic, right? We know that its mortality rate, for example, in India is extremely high. Um, but, uh, you know, comparatively in, say, San Francisco, it's extremely low over 30 or 40 years. Um, and so the question becomes, if you start your baseline at a very high level, uh, where does that get you, um, ultimately? Yeah. Other questions? Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was, well, thank you for your presentation. That was very nice. I was wondering whether among those reactions of the people, which might have been overreactions sometimes, were also, um, well, it was also a tendency to accept new ideas, new concepts, new, I don't know, healing techniques maybe from the outside. And because I come from the field of sinology, and as you may know, there were, well, I mean, Remnants of this pest were also found in northern China around mm -hmm. 300 CE. And there you can see that Buddhist ideas were easily accepted because they came along with new medical techniques. And so I was wondering whether a similar development was also seen in Europe. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, this is uh, Misha Meyer is pretty much the only person to an extent who's worked on cultural history of the pandemic. Um, and that's been his argument, which we can agree or disagree, but it's at least uh, uh, moving the debate, I would say, forward in a new direction for certain. Um, you know, the, the famous case that I can think of off the top of my head uh, comes, from, uh, comes from Gaul, which is the Rogation days, um, uh, as Gregory writes about them, are done in Gaul uh, because of that. Now, there's a longer history to that, where it's picked up and how it's changed between city to city. Um, but yeah, there's events. There's also a, a series of fasts in the East as well, um, where people are, are, are fasting potentially because of the plague outbreak. Um, you know, but another, again, this is what's uh, fascinating to me. This is why, you know, as, as much as I've worked on this, it's interesting the questions that are not asked versus what is asked, right? So there's been no work, relatively speaking, on say cultural memory of the pandemic, right? How does this linger on in later generations? Because there's one major outbreak, but then there's a series of others that happen. Um, you know, there's, uh, this certainly has a memory in say Arabic sources um, that could be explored in quite a bit of detail. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's an outbreak, which I guess almost no one has noticed in, in Isidore of Seville, um, <laughs> which I was reading the other day. Um, so there's certainly a, a cultural memory of this, um, but this is why I, I, you know, I think those are the questions that are interesting, at least to me, that I think we ultimately have to ask, um, rather than, rather than numbers, because, you know, I, I always like to show, uh, I don't always, but uh, there's, you know, this is the great question of the 1918 influenza, right? I didn't use this slide in the talk, but, you know, why did everyone forget the 1918 influenza is this like burning question, right? And it mostly has to do with the fact that how people thought about disease and science, as I explained, changes over the 20th century. It doesn't have to do with the fact that people literally forgot it, right? You can't just 
wipe people's memories unless it's uh, one of those devices from uh, uh, Men in Black where they like wipe your devices. That's probably a really old cultural reference. But anyways, uh, but what, what struck me as I was thinking here, and here's from the COVID tracking project because the United States didn't actually have a centralized database of tracking COVID deaths. Uh, put that aside, but that was the case. Um, and so the Atlantic actually put in this COVID tracking project. And what I noted were, were, were these two days here I've circled, which were two of the 10 or so, again, C and D are outliers here, of the highest numbers of mortality days, right? Those days are January 6th and January 7th of 2021, right? Right, so again, I've saved this. What the, that's what the New York Times obviously looks like the next two days. COVID is the bottom left corners um, for, good and obvious reasons. Um, but again, this is how cultural memory works, right? Other events bubble up. And so these are questions that certainly need a lot more work done. Um, but I'd love to chat with you about um, uh, your work on, on China because that's the exact type of work that I think needs to be done um, in the West. And uh, you know, the you know, one thing that people like to say, and it's true, is that it is a global history of disease, right? The disease, if you track it, its transmission allows you to trace where the disease is, um, you know, in China, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe, such as you have remains. And then you can begin to ask those types of questions. And I think those are the exact questions that need to be done. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. And um, it was really interesting. Um, I was. I have two questions. I was wondering about the, just about the timeline because you were uh, talking about the the plague in the five forties, but on the, um, the announcement for the talk, it was uh, sixth century through the eighth. Um, so how is that? Does that bubble up occasionally, or is that some? Mm -hmm. low, what's happening between the five forties and the eighth century? That's um, one question, and the other one was. I mean, you're uh, trying to level uh, the differences between pre-modern and modern responses. When you say Procopius supernatural beings, it's no different from, I don't know, all of us uh, manically using Clorox to wipe everything down in a radius of a kilometer or so. But, you know, you could, uh, absent the germ theory of disease, some of these responses anyways are bound to be slightly more irrational. And perhaps, or I just wanted to see how far you're willing to push this leveling. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So I'll, I'll take the second question first. I mean, this is why I said, you, you know, you, I haven't found a term that I like. I used irrational because that's what I think of my own response in retrospect. Um, but yeah, I mean, which one is scientifically more rational? Of course, anything that's, that's post-germ theory, uh, post-bacteriological evolution, whatever you want to call it, circa 1900, a little before, but you know, called circa 1900, uh, and public health, which is a little before that, is bound to be more scientifically plausible than me throwing a pitcher uh, into a street to scare off you know, ghosts or something, right? But this is why I said you, would, uh, you need to do essentially a, a history of that response in its time. Um, and I do think that that, that is you know, the case. I mean, this is what happens in, in you know, this is, Charles Rosenberg's work from you know 50 years ago now about cholera, you know what he tracks very clearly is is you know people had less rational responses to the early outbreaks of cholera in the 1830s, and then that trend changes over time. But people still do have kind of you know out there responses. Um, so that's what I would say. But there need to be a history. I don't know the term irrational is what came to mind, but it's probably not a good one. Um, someone who's worked on these topics would probably tell me no, this is a term you need to use. But um, I think that's definitely the case. Um, as for the, the, the timeline, uh, there are later outbreaks of plague um, that happen in the West as they're recorded in Latin and Greek that occur through 750. Um, that certainly is the case. Um, they're often called plague waves. I, I have strongly argued that we should not be calling them waves. Um, in fact, actually, we shouldn't be calling them COVID waves either, um, because in fact, what's actually happening is certainly because of how the, the plague epidemiology works, it's a local seeding event, right? So that it goes back into the animals probably, and again, we just don't have the evidence, but almost certainly goes back into the animals and then it spills over 
every once in a while from these animals. We can kind of track that in the second plague pandemic. There's good work that just came out in, in past and present by Phil Slavin, um, who tracks this really nicely, that he thinks there's a German focal point. So everyone always thinks these waves keep washing ashore from the east, which is why there's you know, basically racism about the East and colonialism. But in fact, it's actually almost certainly a, a Southern German, if I remember correctly, a manifestation. And that's almost certainly the case actually when it comes to COVID, right? This isn't as if waves of COVID are washing ashore in the United States or Switzerland, right? It's local cases that expand outward. Um, and so we call these things waves as if, uh, and I think on purpose to an extent how we use it, as if it comes from the outside and washes ashore over and over again. And that's almost not the case, right? I mean, the initial wave, yes, right? You can track, uh, you know, people have done the phylogenetic analysis in real time, essentially, of COVID to see that it's basically, yes, you can see it seeding over time and you can see the various, you know, alpha and delta seeding itself. But after that, it's local manifestations, almost certainly. Um, and so that's that's the thing. But uh, uh, the other thing I should say is, again, this is why I find this whole discussion keeps bringing me back in as much as I don't want it to. There's very little research done on the later outbreaks of plague out of the 540s, right? You know, we can have debates over why. There's almost no research outside of Latin and Greek. Um, there's a little bit of work done on the Syriac. Um, there's one famous dissertation which spawned a series of articles in Arabic. Um, but as I do, whenever I talk about this, I said, can someone please just go searching through, say, like the Babylonian Talmud for me and see if you find anything? Um, can you go through Coptic sources, right? I've said this for, I think, three years now. Um, but when, <laughs> You know, I don't have the linguistic capabilities. I mean, part of part of this, you know, showing my team at the end is I, I don't think you should do this alone. I don't think anyone has really the linguistic skills. The and if you do, then you don't have the the epidemiological skills. All these types of things that you need to really bring together. I don't have the archaeological context, so I bring in my colleague Janet Kay and others who do the archaeology, right? Because at the end of the day, this really can't be done by a single person. Um, so that's what I'll say. That's my pitch for multidisciplinary research. And then you can all say, yes, but everyone's career is based on sole authored books and blah, blah, blah. That's the obvious debate we can then have. But those are my two cents and my slight uh, rambling uh, pitch for that. I would uh, like to c come back to, uh, on the economic impact. Now, I was struck uh, by the comparison you showed us between the data from uh, from Sweden and uh, and the pollen data from the Medi uh, Mediterranean, and um, I mean, the Mediterranean data seems to show really show nothing. It's uh, frust frustratingly <laughs> nothing. So. Um, uh, if uh, if this does in fact um, uh, mirror or um, or um, yes shows uh, shows the the economic development, how do we explain that the plague did not have an economic impact? I mean, uh, from all that we we. Uh, uh, that we read about uh, about the plague in our in, in the written sources, um, we would in fact uh, expect the the Sweden picture with with this very deep impact, uh, and um, if it did not have that impact, why not? How could it not have this impact? Yeah, no, that's a good question, right? I always uh, end up getting put in that situation to explain. <laughs> <laughs> what did not happen. <laughs> yeah, what did not. I mean, you know, that's, it's a longer debate over, over this debate, which has played out now for a few years with a number of colleagues. Oh. And, and so I always, in, you know, I do think the impetus should be on if you think this is a major event, you have to oh. prove it rather than meet the other way around. But um, what I would say is, I mean, you, you could you come up with a bunch of plausible ideas, oh. right? Um, so first of all, I should say, I do think it has at least an immediate Im uh, economic impact. I think that's certainly the case. Um, if the Anona papyri data is, is to be believed, which I think it is, um, you know, people have suggested other papyri data, but I don't think it's actually there um, if you contextualize it all. Um, but what I think is probably happening is it's, uh, you know, it's a more regional based effect. Mm -hmm. And I think there's more pollen data from what I understand from my colleagues coming out of Western Europe 
soon that shows more regional variation. And I've seen some others that'll come out, I think in, in the next few months uh, in a study that actually does show in some regions there is a profound uh, decline in some regions of the Middle East rather than say uh, the Balkans and Turkey. Um, so, you know, in that sense, what I think is more likely is in some regions it's accelerating uh, existing trends um, that are happening. And, and this is why, you know, the, the thing I did with, with, with Palo Tedesco, I thought was kind of interesting because it forced me to stretch and do new work on taxes, right? Mm. To learn the, the late Roman tax system, which Palo knows better than, than anyone I would, I would suggest. Uh, and, and what you see there is, is the, the changes to the laws are part of that process. But how taxes are collected, how they're administered, or been changing across the late fifth century, how the laws are reacting to that. And so I think the plague does make a, a change to that. We might say accelerate it. Um, we might say decelerate it. Um, but I don't think it's, it's as profound, perhaps, as, as we might also imagine. Um, that's, you know, my, my, my view on this. But, you know, the, the economics are also, you know, if you want to be difficult with the coins, no one wants to take them up on my coins debate. Um, the other problem with the coin change I showed that Alan would tell me is in the Mint of Venice, which is, you know, perfectly mm. recorded information, right? We know the coins and we also have the records of what happens in the 14th century. The change in coins takes about 10, I think five or 10 years. Um, and so this is the question is, mm. is how can you pull it apart? And I think sometimes the Black Death is a useful comparison, sometimes it's not. Um, and so that's what I would say, but I do think it's a more regional impact. Um, and that's what has to be done. I mean, I've suggested a whole bunch of things that we still have to do, but you can see why I don't like arguing on the, on the mortality um, question, because I think that ultimately leads you into a black hole of how many people died, and then you also are assuming deaths equal other things happen. Mm. Um, well, uh, I think with uh, this invitation to do uh, a lot more work and research on the on the Chisinianic plague and plagues in general in uh, in history, uh, we uh, we can end uh, at least uh, the, this talk uh, this evening. Uh, not the evening itself. We are still invited uh, to go down to the men's, I think, uh, of uh, of this building to uh, two stairs down uh, for a glass of, of wine. You're all invited, of course, and uh, maybe you also have to, to talk to uh, the chance to, to talk some more uh, with our um, colleague. Uh, thank you again thank you. Uh, for this wonderful talk. It was highly interesting, I think, for Every one of us, we are, uh, we have heard so much about pandemics and sometimes I think I've heard too much about it, uh, but it's still fascinating uh, again and again to, to hear about, uh, about your work and, and what you, you and your, your team has, has done on these, uh, on these uh, topics. So thank you very thank you. much again.